Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. The war in Yemen and its humanitarian crisis are on the news every so often. We've all seen images, and we vaguely know that the Saudis, backed by the Americans, are waging a war against Yemen, causing massive civilian casualties, as well as famine and a cholera epidemic. Some of us know that there's a militia called the Houthis, and they may have something to do with Iran. But how did Yemen get here? History didn't start in 2015 when the Saudi and Emirati war began, not during the Arab Spring when Yemen's dictator was overthrown, nor in the civil war of the 1990s. Yemen's modern history is fascinating and overlooked. This is especially unfortunate because leftists may not be aware of the Marxist Republic that existed in South Yemen from 1967 to 1990. Here to help us make sense of recent events and put them in their historical context, is Helen Lackner, author of several books, including Yemen in Crisis, The Road to War. And she has a forthcoming book titled Yemen, Poverty and Conflict, set to be published next year by Routledge. Helen, welcome. Hi, thanks for inviting me to this show. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm really excited to, to, to talk to you about Yemen. It, it, it's in many ways hard to know where to begin. Um, you know, I'm fascinated by Yemen's socialist past, the Saudi and Egyptian interventions on opposite sides, the Israeli role. All this in many ways has parallels with today's crisis. And, you know, as you've actually mentioned in your most recent book, you, as socialism is on the rise among young people across the West, I think a great place to start is Yemen's socialist history. And as you know, you know, Yemen's mostly viewed as this like underdeveloped, poor, backwards country that's kind of in perpetual crisis, but that wasn't always the case. So I guess my first question would be for you is, was the Yemeni experience with socialism successful and why did it end? Okay, well, I think the first thing to remember is that, you know, Yemen is now one state, uh, supposedly. That's something we can discuss in more detail later. But between the 60s and 1990, it was two states. And you had in the north the Yemen Arab Republic, which you just mentioned. And in the south, or you had the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen from 1967 until 1990. And this came as a successor to the British uh, colony of Aden and the South Arabian protectorates. So basically, the socialist part of Yemen was the one that had previously been under British domination. And as mentioned, it, the socialist period lasted from 1969 really until 1990 so basically just over 20 years i think it's important to remember when we look at that you know that this was the period of the cold war which many younger people may have forgotten all about if they ever knew about it mm -hmm. and it was also a period where this cold war had the different manifestations in third world countries and yemen was one of them so in the Arabian Peninsula, and indeed in the whole Middle East, the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen was the only socialist state aligned with the world socialist movement. And here again, you need to remember that this was just at the end of the Sino-Soviet dispute. So you actually had a big split between you know, Soviet-oriented socialism and um, China-oriented socialism. Again, a very different world from today's world. So what you had was a regime in the PDRY which emerged out of the movement of Arab nationalists and other Middle Eastern movements which were on the left, which also gave birth to organizations like the People's Front for the Liberation of Oman, the People's Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, etc. So I'm not sure that you want to go into those details. But within Yemen itself, I think, you know, the regime, you were asking whether it was successful. I think you have to look at different features of the regime. I think in terms of internal policy and internal politics, the regime of the PDRY provided the vast majority of the population, if indeed the whole population, with a basic acceptable living standard. Mm 
which was significantly above what the actual um, economic and financial means of the country were, because again it came into it came into power it, just after in 1967. One of the the two main resources of the country prior to independence had been the port of Aden which of course depended enormously on the Suez Canal, which was itself closed after the June 67 war. So that eliminated one whole massive expectation of economic and financial income for the state. And the second element was the British uh, presence and the military presence, which of course left ended when they left. So the socialist regime inherited a a state which was extremely impoverished. It had very limited resources. It had some fish, it had some agriculture, it tried to develop some industries within the socialist framework. It also lacked, you know, it was considered as the only East European stroke Soviet alliance state in the region. It was viewed with extreme hostility and, and actual aggression both by the bourgeoisie and the others who had left Aden at independence and the neighboring states. I mean, who are the neighboring states? You know, at the beginning you had Oman where you still had the war uh, between the regime and the People's Front for the Liberation of Oman. In the north you had the Saudi Arabia, which was very strongly Wahhabi at the time. And in the north of Yemen, by 1970, you had a Republican movement, which was really very, very close to the previous monarchy because the left wing of that movement had also been defeated in 67 and 68. So these are all very complicated factors and I don't know if you want me to go more into you know the internal situation. I mean, yeah, I think it's really interesting in a few ways because there's two things. First, it's like you mentioned, of course, this is the only sort of socialist bloc country in the entire region. Why? Why Yemen? Why only South Yemen for that matter? Um, and did it have to do maybe the fact that it was South Yemen with the response from its northern neighbor being Saudi Arabia? So I guess there's two questions in there. Why did we have socialism emerge in Yemen, unlike maybe other parts of the Middle East in South Yemen? And what was the regional reaction to it? Like, how did the region split? Uh, or maybe which side supported the socialist uh country in South Yemen or did not support it and why? Well, I think your second question is the easiest one, which is basically <laughs> no one in the region supported them. Everybody was, you know, extremely against them. I mean, the, the regime was, you know, had opposed Nasserism, so it was not supported by NASA. It was not in support of, um, of either Iraqi or Syrian Baathism. So basically, no one in the region supported them. This other element of why it became socialist, I think, was really a matter of the internal factional fighting and victories within the movement. As I explained, the movement that won independence was the National Liberation Front. That one was rival to another military front called the FLOSI, the Front for the Liberation of Occupied South Yemen, which was supported by the Egyptians and which which the NLF actually physically militarily defeated in August 1967. Therefore, you have, you know, the Nasserists were out. You then had the NLF who won. The NLF was at that time a great mixture between, you know, small scale local nationalist movements and a number of people who had been the leadership who had been influenced by the movement of Arab nationalists, which, as I said, also brought the, the you know, the Palestinian uh, People's Front, the Omani Front, various other fronts throughout the region. So, and you then had a further succession, you were asking also why it ended and, and in a sense, what were the problems? And one of the main problems that, you know, really led to its demise in the long run was the internal factional fighting within the NLF, which later by 1978 became the Yemeni Socialist Party. But maybe we can go into that a bit later. Well, I guess that kind of, you know, this might go into the next question, which is you mentioned, obviously, that Yemen was two countries. It wasn't one until about 30 years ago. So why was Yemen divided into two states? You've kind of alluded to that a bit. 
And then why did that change? Well, I mean, it's difficult to say that it was divided into two states. If you look back, you know, centuries back, you never have a state that covered the exact borders of what is now the Republic of Yemen. You had a number of, of empires and states that covered all of this, so parts of it or different parts of it, so that changed. Things were kind of fossilized, really, in a sense, in 1918, when the Ottomans were defeated, because you then had an agreement between the, the imam who ruled in Sana'a and the British for on the border between the two of them. So that, in a sense, created, you could say, created the two states. I, I mean, I, I hesitate to say states because what was going on in, in the British area was not a single state. It was the colony a of Aden plus the Eastern and Western protectorates. And both, and I, I'm going into this because I think it's relevant to today's situation. You know, oh, things like the Western protectorate contained, I can't even remember how many, almost 20 statelets, you know, some of which were, no bigger than Oxford, I don't think, uh, in terms of population, maybe even smaller. So you have, um, you know, you had a number of statelets, which, and some of them never even joined the protectorates, you know, it, so you had a fragmentation then, which is important because of what's happening today, otherwise I wouldn't really go into it. In the, in what, in what was the imamate, you had a centralized state run by the imam until it was overthrown in 1962 by basically a group of republican officers. So in that, that grouping initially was not significantly different from what you had, say, in Egypt or Syria or Iraq. But it again, it developed differently, partly because the Egyptians came in in support of the republican movement and, and tried to control it and affected it very much. And on the other hand, you had, you know, the, the Imamites or the, the known as the royalists were very openly supported by the Saudis, but also uh, less openly supported by the Brits and various other states. So that's how you had the two states. How did they emerge to become a unified Yemen? I mean, to me, there are a number of factors to that. One is, I would say, and I think that's something, you know, that some people would certainly not agree about. I, my view is that you have something called a Yemeni nation. You have a group, you know, you have a few million people who share sufficient economic, cultural and social characteristics to be Yemenis, which make them different, say, from Omanis or Saudis, whether you want to call them Saudis or not. You know, that doesn't mean that they're all the same. I mean, there's very significant difference, say, between a Hadrami and somebody from Saada. But, you know, and, and uh, but I really think there is this you, this nation. I mean, certainly they share a language and they so share a certain culture. And I think there's very few Yemenis whom, if you met them outside of the borders of their country and you ask them, who are they, would not say, I'm a Yemeni you know, before they would say something else. So you had that strong feeling of a nation. You also had a massive amount of migration between the two states. So you had people who were both, you know, who, who lived, I mean, for example, until 1990, uh, Yemenis in Saudi Arabia did not have to have sponsors, were not subject to the kafala system. And they, you know, they could live, come and go as they wished. So a lot of southern Yemenis who were subject to these rules, because obviously the Saudis weren't too keen on the socialist <laughs> regime, you know, would go into Sana'a, pick up a Sana'ani passport and go on to Saudi. So, so you had, you know, you had, and so people, and you had people on the, across the borders, you had tribal connections, you had family connections. So you had a very strong um, closeness between the two. And if you look at the daily slogans, you know, that people lived with in the schools, I mean, certainly in the PDRY, you know, the slogan of Yemeni unity was the one slogan which was really, really popular. People mm -hmm. did want to be part of a nation. So when, when basically both regimes were in serious crisis in the late 80s, Ali Abdallah Saleh had then been in power for just over 10 years. His so-called democratic credentials were more or less, you know, gone. 
uh, people were frustrated because they didn't see very much. And in the PDRY, you had a very high level of frustration and a lack of credibility after the last big faction fighting of 1986. So when the two leaderships wanted to, to unite, this is something that had massive popular support. And okay. so, and it was also encouraged. I mean, again, you look at the late 80s, what was Gorbachev doing in the, in the Soviet Union? He was encouraging the third world countries related to the Soviet Union to join, you know, to be more independent and less, and less socialists and not to expect too much financial and other aid. So you had a whole host of factors that encouraged uh, unification. And I think the final straw was the discovery of some oil just on basically in the triangle, which is where you have Saudi North and South Yemen. And on previous occasions, the two Yemenis had, Yemen states had fought when things happened. On this one, I think they realized that, you know, if they did fight, what would happen? The Saudis would take the lot and they'd be left with nothing. So the alternative was to get together. So I think that's really the, the, the rationale that brought together unification. Unification didn't happen the way most people wanted it or expected it, but it certainly were in favor of unification. And then not too long after that, you have, I think, a very important moment um, in terms of the trajectory of the economic future of Yemen, which is that Yemen was one of two countries al alongside Cuba to vote against the U.S. war in Iraq in 1991. So can you tell us about why it voted against the war in Iraq? Because, I mean, only two countries did. We know why Cuba did. Uh, can you tell us why Yemen voted against it and about what the consequences of that vote was for Yemen? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that vote happened in 1990. The fighting actually was, the, the war started in 1991. Uh, it, ha I mean, this was a piece of really bad news for the socialists in Yemen. <laughs> Basically, number one, the representative of Yemen at the UN was Abdallah al-Ashtal, who was a very determined socialist. The second point that's really important to remember is that the relations between the PDRY and Iraq had been abysmal extremely bad they you know the 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 iraqi baathists had sent a couple of people to assassinate an iraqi communist teacher in aden itself and the yemenis had actually occupied the embassy to extract these guys i forget i think that was in 1979 i can't remember exactly which date that happened so basically the you know, the representative of what had been the PDRY, who was now the representative of the Republic of Yemen, was forced to take a vote, which I strongly suspect he would not have voted if he had been given the option. The reason that it was the option is that Ali Abdullah Saleh, on the other hand, was a great enthusiast of Iraq and great friend of Saddam Hussein. And I think he basically forced this vote to happen. So that I think that's really the reason why that happened. The consequences were disastrous for Yemen. As I said, it happened two months after unification, sorry, three months after unification, whatever, a few months after unification. And it had a very negative impact economically. I mean, one, it was no described by the U.S. representative of the U.N. as the most expensive vote in history. The U.S. immediately cut their aid. They prevented the World Bank and the such organizations from providing aid. Many other bilaterals also cut down any aid they had given. And in addition, the GCC states expelled about 800,000 Yemenis. So that meant that both the remittances of all these people suddenly disappeared and they and their families were back in Yemen, basically destitute with nothing and therefore an additional burden on the Yemeni economy. So it really did have a very, very negative impact. And for the following four or five years, there was practically no international support to the Yemeni regime in terms of aid and development funding. Um, I think that to some extent, you know, some of the problems that emerged over the next decades actually can be attributed to this, not exclusively, but certainly I think it played a role in that. Oh my God, absolutely. I mean, if you destroy a country's economy, um, that definitely 
determines its future in many ways. And I mean, also in this decade, which is something that you've written extensively about, uh, not only was Yemen's economy destroyed because of this one vote that the U.S. punished it for, but it went on to be impacted by structural adjustment programs um, that, of course, many people who are watching this program are probably familiar with that term uh, as being a part of destroying the global south um, throughout the 90s with these, you know, kind of loans from the IMF and World Bank um, that, it, you know, forced all kinds of neoliberal reforms on these countries. So can you talk about how structural adjustment policies and these sorts of international instit uh, financial institution loans uh, impacted Yemen? Yeah, I think in if, Yemen was always uh, an IDA country, which meant that its loans, you know, were very low interest. So it wasn't so much that. It was much more the conditionalities imposed by the IMF and the World Bank, which really affected uh, the, the living conditions of the people. And this was done through a number of, of features. One was this very strong encouragement of privatization and including privatization of public services. So that, you know, you suddenly had things like cost recovery in health. You had similar um, developments encouraging private education. So those services suddenly became much more expensive for people when they had when their incomes were not by any means increasing if anything they were decreasing so that's one element uh, another element was the policy of encouraging the private sector in the broadest sense so that instead of providing aid to state institutions the idea was to focus on um, sort of what they'd call non you know, non-public institutions. So in that respect, in Yemen in particular, two institutions were set up. One was called the Social Fund for Development and the other one was called the Public Works Project. Both of these are still in existence. And both of these are basically a kind of parastatal, but they operated according to private sector rules, which meant that their staff were much, much better paid than those in the in the ministries. And consequently, they got most of the funding and they acted uh, as, uh, you know, and so the best staff would go there. So you had an undermining process that prevented the state, the admin state administration from developing adequately. So it was really a mechanism which undermined the state, which again, I think it was another element that contributed to, you know, to, to the current situation and to the gradual disintegration and weakening of, of the state. I mean, the, the third element, which was, you know, which has more positive sides really is that, you know, a lot of embassies, a lot of countries had small scale development programs, which they provided directly to community organizations. So some of these were, were had a positive impact. Uh, but all altogether, the whole process was a process of undermining the state and encouraging the supposedly private sector, e even when there wasn't much private sector around to be encouraged. Yeah, I mean, in conjunction with this, the 90s was also a period of, you know, the role of the so-called Afghan Arabs um, who had originally been basically in Afghanistan, right? The Afghan Arabs fighting with the Mujah alongside the Mujahideen uh, in this war against the communist back but government there. But ultimately they did end up returning to Yemen. So what was their role in Yemen and why did they come to Yemen? Well, they came back to they came back to Yemen because they came home and they'd won the war in Afghanistan. So I mean they, they had no further rationale for being out there. Some of them, I mean, came back in 89, early 1990s, still with the idea of fighting the dreaded communists in the South. But basically, the dreaded communists in the South had, had more or less vanished anyway when the when unification happened. So, you know, that, that was a reason for being there. Um, you know, they'd come home. Uh, their role was really to contribute and to cooperate with the more uh, Islamist movements, and when the first, well, well, let's not call it first or second, when the civil war started in 1994 between the North and the South, they contributed to uh, fighting the Southerners, the separatists in the South. 
who basically were described as again the dreaded um, atheist communists etc etc so <laughs> so they participated in things like the destruction of of um, religious um you know sufi shrines and other things of that kind um and of course they contributed and some of their elements you know later emerged or joined in with the with the aqap or whatever <laughs> And we can get we can get into that in a little bit. And I guess real quick before I move on to some topics that are more I think relevant to the conflict today, I just wanted to to ask because it, it caught my attention. I mean, you talked about there was a lot of aggression towards Yemen as a socialist country, and you mentioned some Iraqi aggression, right, by assassinating this communist leader. I guess can you just give a couple other examples of what this one socialist country in the Middle East was up against? What kind of aggression they faced? from maybe both their neighbors as well as perhaps um, bigger forces like the U.S.? Well, basically, you know, they were coping with uh, armed incursions from the north. They were co coping with the odd armed incursions from uh, from Saudi Arabia. So, you know, there was endless amount and, of course, no, no financial or economic support, despite the fact, and I think the important thing here is that for Yemenis, you know, what they saw is that in those other countries, there was lots and lots of wealth. And I remember spending a lot of time and failing abysmally to trying to explain to people that, you know, 8 million barrels of oil per day for sort of 30 million people is not the same thing as 200,000 barrels of oil for the same 30 million people or whatever the figure was at the time. So there was a level of expectation from people you know, which was not very realistic, which also created problems. So I think that's really it. I mean, internationally, you know, obviously um, the US, you know, did not recognize the PDRY. I forget when they, I think they came back after unification, shortly, I forget. Um, uh, and, you know, was definitely hostile. But I, I mean, it's important to remember that in a sense, you know, Yemen didn't really feature very prominently in, uh, in U.S. policy. <laughs> it's one way to put it. Yeah. Um, so I guess moving on to, to more like kind of relevant topics to the current conflict, you know, you wrote in a recent piece for the European Council on Foreign Relations that it's wrong to view the Houthis, uh, which is the movement fighting in Yemen, as an Iranian proxy. Um, and of course, while they may be allied with Iran, they are, in fact, a local Yemeni movement with a local Yemeni agenda. So I guess from that, can you explain to our viewers and listeners, who are these Houthis and who are the Zaidi Muslims, right, which is the, the branch of Islam that they follow? Um, who are they? How did they emerge from these Zaidi Muslims, the Houthis, that is? How did they come to take over so much of the country? And what is it they want? What are they fighting for? Well, I think it's important not to, you know, make an instant parallel between Zaidi and Houthi or, you know, because basically in Yemen, you have two primary forms of Islam. You have the Zaidis, who are a form of Shia, who are known as Fivers, as opposed to the Iranian Shia, who are Twelvers, and the and theologically, and I'm absolutely not a theologian, so really, you know, can't go into details on that. But, you know, theologically, they're known to have very few differences from the Shafi'is, who are the Sunnis uh, in Yemen and who form the majority of the country. Um, I was just thinking, if only we had a map, you can't really see the map behind me. Mm. But basically, the, the Zaydis live in the in the highlands in the kind of pocket that starts from the Saudi border, goes down to about Yarim and goes up again, uh, and is basically the highland bit in the middle of the country. And they were the ones who were running the country and running the north, you know, basically until the, um, well, in fact, until um, 2015, every single president mm -hmm. and imam and everything prior to Hadi were Zaydis. But you did not, but sectarianism was not a real daily feature of life. Yes, a lot of people were not that happy that only Zaydis had position, major positions in the Republican movement. And certainly, 
you know, the Zaydis in the Imamate were all, all Zaydis, of course. Um, the main ideological position of the Houthis is that they believe that Sada, who are known as Hashemites or Ashraf in other parts of the Muslim world, basically the descendants of the Prophet, have the innate right to rule, i.e. rulers must be from the Prophet's family, must be Sada. And that is an important feature because that is something that alienates a lot of people in Yemen. Um, the reason they have um, managed to take control, they basically control all the Zaidi areas, plus a few uh, non-Zaidi areas, for example, the, the, the coast, the Tihama coast down to Hodeida, and in the east, you know, not Mareb, which is a contested area, but for example, Al-Beida governorate and parts of Taiz and, um, and Ib governorates, where, which are where Ib is divided between the two. In fact, the two groups religiously. Mm -hmm. um, the the reason they've succeeded there's there's basically a whole host of reasons why they're winning. Uh, one of them is that the opposition to them is extremely divided. When you look at the so-called internationally recognized government and its allies, you know the divisions between them are just enormous. And so they they don't they're not conf they, you don't have what Houthis versus another entity. You have Houthis versus the whole whole of other div divided entities, some of which are fighting each other. So you know that helps them a long way. A second element, of course, is the Saudi external aggression. I mean, that gets for them gets them the support of tribal people and many others because people oppose aggression from the Saudis. You know, at the popular level, people's relationship, Yemeni's vision of Saudis is very, very ambiguous because there's been a very long relationship between the two countries. People, millions of Yemenis have spent time in Saudi. You know, the, the remittances from Saudi are extremely important. There's all kinds of these factors. But at the same time, there is a strong tension and, and one can say mutual dislike, you know, of people. So, so, and Yemenis are, you know, nationalists and they believe in their own capacities and pride. And, you know, they don't like the aggression. So being anti-aggression brings together with the Houthis a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't be supporting them. And I think a third element, which is also very important, is the Houthis run a very repressive regime. You know, in Houthi land, as I now call it, you know, it is not a good, there's a lot of things you can't do. I mean, it's not, it is not, uh, you know, you, you don't have, you don't have Western liberal democracy in Houthi land. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's an understatement. It's one way to put it. Yes, you do definitely don't have Western liberal de democracy there. But I think that um, you know, we kind of we could I guess we were kind of going through a timeline in a way because we started out with the sort of socialist era, talked about the '90s, and I guess that would put us in the next would be the war on terror era, right? So I think most people who you know aren't keen Yemen followers aren't aware that the Houthis were actually being bombed by the Yemeni Air Force in the mid 2000s. And Ali Abdullah Saleh, who is kind of like, who, you know, cleverly sort of like was on different sides at different times, whatever was best for him. He actually used the pretext of the war on terror to gain Western support for a war essentially on his opponents. Um, at the same time, he also used Wahhabis against his opponents, which I think may, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the use of Wahhabis, at least in the North, may have actually helped push for the formation of the Houthis or made them stronger. I'm not sure you can clarify on that, but can you tell us about this kind of war on terror period and how the Houthis factored in? Yeah, I, I would separate the two in a sense. I think the war on terror is one story and the rise of the Houthis is another. No, you're absolutely right in the sense that, um, you know, Saleh encouraged the development of the Wahhabi Salafi movement in the in the heart of Houthi land, which is the Saada governorate near Saudi Arabia, by the, encouraging the, the development of this Salafi school uh, in a place called Damage, which is just on the outskirts, I suppose you could say, of Saada. So in that sense, 
um, he did encourage, and that was one of the elements which 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 encouraged the ladies to sponsor the development of the Believing Youth Organization, which became the Houthi movement in the long run and was run by a member of the Houthi family. So, you know, so that is one thing. Now, you had the, the you had a series of six, what are known in the general world of Yemen as the six Houthi wars between 20, 2004 and 2010. And these were wars that opposed uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh and his regime and the Houthi movement. But the way they were run and the way they were operated contributed, in fact, to the strengthening of the Houthi movement which was much stronger by the end of the sixth war, uh, the ceasefire, which was in February 2010, than it had been in 2004 when it started. So I think that's one thing. I think also you had at that time, you had, uh, you know, Ali Abdullah Saleh tried to persuade the Americans to help support him against the Houthis by claiming that the Houthis were Iranian agents. And you have stuff in, in WikiLeaks of the Americans pointing out that this is absolute nonsense and they didn't believe a word of it. And the Americans were actually quite irritated because the money that they were giving Ali Abdullah Saleh to fight uh, Al-Qaeda basically was being diverted towards the Ali Abdullah Saleh's battle against the Houthis. So, you know, the Houthi war was one thing. Uh, the, 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 the Saleh position on great war against terrorism um, was something else. And yes, you know, Saleh was the first visitor to Washington after 9-11, you know, where he went and immediately said, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you all the way. And, you know, I think he remembered the mistake he, that had been made in 1990. And therefore, he got a lot of assistance to you know, help and develop his security and military forces, supposedly against a AQ at that time and now AQ, ACAP, I call it, um, later. But I think it's also important to know that the relationship between Saleh and the, you know, the Salafi terrorists, if you want to call them that, um, you know, was very ambiguous. And a lot of them operated uh, in close coordination with him. And people would start as supposedly members of, you know, a Salafi terrorist movement and end up in the security forces. So you had a very ambiguous relationship there, which some of the Americans were well aware of and, uh, you know, were not exactly happy about. And then, of course, you know, we get to the Arab Spring in 2011. Things seemed so hopeful because there was a, an uprising in Yemen that didn't quite, you know, that was quickly, I think, overshadowed by other uh, problems in the region, particularly the disaster that, you know, ended up taking place in Syria, what happened in Libya. Um, but, you know, uh, there was overthrow of a dictatorship in Yemen. There was great hope. And then not that many years later, you end up with this horrible, awful war um, being led by Saudi Arabia. Uh, so can you, this is, I think, where people get confused because the war is covered in the media in a very vague way where you just kind of know Yemen's getting bombed. You know Saudi Arabia with American help is leading it. You're not really quite sure why. So I guess, can you fill in some of those blanks for our listeners and viewers? You know, what countries, first of all, I guess in the region besides Saudi Arabia are involved in the war on Yemen, first of all, because it isn't just Saudi Arabia, though they're of course the leader and maybe it's increasingly mostly them who want to keep it going. Um, also, what is the Western role in this war, specifically the role of the UK and the US? And who are they fighting exactly? And like, why? Why are they doing this? Why is this coalition led by Saudi Arabia fighting this war in Yemen that's causing a famine? What do they want out of it? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it is, you it should is. have uh, split them up a little bit. Well, I guess, okay, let's start with this. Who's so so? Why? Let's start with the why. I think that's what people really want to know. Is like why is Saudi Arabia, with the help of the U.S. and U.K. and other regional players, fighting this horrific, atrocious war against Yemen? <laughs> 
Well, I think the first thing you have to realize that actually the war is an internal Yemeni war between different groups. And the external intervention is, you know, an added problem, but it is not the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is within Yemen between the different Yemeni factions. And that's something, again, one can go into separately. The Saudis, you know, Basically, let's go back to 2011. The, the movement, the revolutionary movement in, in Yemen in 2011 was extremely widespread. And it also went on for many, many years. And it included in the anti-Saleh movement, it included, you know, a whole broad range of people from all over the country, you know, include and it was it had a lot of potential in terms of bringing people together who would not normally be talking to each other being inclusive in terms of bringing people from different social strata together who would not again not normally be doing um having of not normally realizing their shared interests i think is the way i would put it so you had that but what happened is that um on 18th of march 2011 the Saleh people uh, killed about 50 demonstrators in one of the Friday, uh, prior, regular Friday demonstrations. And as a result of that, what you had is that a group of Yemeni politicians, including elites and including uh, a major military faction, uh, claimed to shift and to abandon Saleh and join the revolution. And that basically meant you then had an intra-elite split, including the you know military factions on both sides ready to fight each other. At that point, you had the international community getting involved and saying, you know, Saleh can't really uh, survive this. We've got to find a solution, and we don't want a solution that's going to create a major, major fundamental transformation. So they pushed for what became known as the GCC agreement, which was not entirely, in fact, the original text was built, was an internal Yemeni text, but it was sponsored as the GCC agreement. And it was, that was signed on in November 2011 and led to Saleh having to abandon the presidency, but he stayed present uh, and politically active at the head of his political organization. And the transitional regime, sorry, read by his previous uh, vice president, Hadi, with, you know, part of the other factions. So you had a transitional regime that was supposed to make a to bring out a new Yemen and which was supposed to take into consideration or respond to some extent to the concerns of the population that had been manifested in the demonstrations. Yeah. And this, of course, was supported by the GCC, who chose to put their name to it, uh, and, and primarily by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So you had a transition which lasted for two, two, two and a half years, or two years basically. And when that failed and fell apart, because on, by that time, Saleh and who, the Houthis were working together, um, and they, they basically managed to bring down the transitional regime, and eventually the official recognized regime moved to Aden, and called for assistance from the Saudis to put it back into into place. And that was uh, basically uh, approved by the UN Security Council Resolution 2216 in 2015, which endorsed the Saudi and coalition intervention. Mm -hmm. Now, when the Saudis got involved in militarily in 2015, they had expected to get to form a big coalition with particularly with various states whom they expected as absolutely straightforward military practical support and two of those which were really expected was pakistan and egypt pakistan got out and just never did uh, the egyptians weren't exactly enthusiastic because they remembered what had happened in the 1960s in the yar where they lost thousands of people and so although they were formerly part of the coalition their activities were mainly i think on the maritime scale but they did very little um in certainly had no sent no troops um 
So basically, the main elements of the Saudi-led coalition, as it likes to be called, are primarily the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. They also got a lot of troops from Sudan in particular, at least until their revolution in 19, in, sorry, in 2019. Mm -hmm. And so, and the, most of these were withdrawn, but I think, you know, they can be basically, they, they were in it for the money. I mean, both at an individual level, people joined because they wanted to earn money, and at a state level, because the, the leadership, you know, was supported by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and um, Emirates. So, you know, the, the Saudis are in it because, you know, they are very concerned about the Houthis. They're not fundamentally concerned about Zaydis. They supported the Zaydi imam in the 1960s against the, the Republicans in, in what was then the YR. So it's not a sectarian issue. And now that MES anyway, in any case, you know, has is, is cancelled and abandoned the whole Wahhabi lock, He's not going to be particularly interested in uh, worried about about that aspect of things, but I mean they they see the Houthis as a threat and they particularly see the Houthis as a threat for two basic reasons. One, they see the Houthis as a substitute for Iran, which is a view shared by the by certainly by the Trump administration, if not by the current administration. And secondly, because the Houthis are actually threatening their borders and lobbying, you know, a few missiles across the borders on a regular basis. So, so they are, you know, they are very unhappy about this. But I think you have to, you know, recognize that the Saudi involvement, number one, has reduced enormously. I mean, the, the very, you know, murderous events that you were referring to were really in the first years, 15, 16, 17, 18. The last two, two or three years, they've really very much more closely connected to, to purely military targets. And, you know, they are also, now they desperately want to get out. I mean, they got in in 2015 thinking this was going to be a quick war. They were going to win it in a matter of weeks. <laughs> and, you know, the Houthis would just give in and, and, you know, come begging for peace. Well, I mean, it's pretty obvious by now we're getting towards to, you know, the end of seven years that this is not the case. So they really want to get out now. Uh, and, you know, they, they have a number of problems. I mean, one of the problems is the Houthis who are not, that keen on letting them get out. And the second one, of course, is the prob inc developing increasing problems with the United Arab Emirates, who have very different objectives in Yemen and who are much more focused, where they're, they're apparently focused on the South, but basically they're focused on their maritime, on their maritime ambitions. Well, that actually was a very good breakdown of the entire uh, conflict in the briefest amount of time I've ever heard. So thank you for that. I wanted to uh, also ask you, um, you know, what is Yemen's geostrategic importance, if you had to describe it? Yeah, I'm I'm not into geostrategy. I used to think, you know, <laughs> if I, you look at the world and you look at some place in the back end of nowhere and you think, what's the geostrategic position importance of this one and you can't see it and I've myself you know for example said that Mahra has no strategic position well I mean I've been made to look a bit of a fool on that one um, I mean the one thing that is obvious you know is the Bab al-Mandab you know yeah. Yemen is one side of the Bab al-Mandab and that is you know basically controls I forget which massive percentage of world trade and it's the entrance to the to the Suez Canal and so you know, that, that is a very, very obvious one. And now the Emiratis have, you know, basically taken control of the island of Perim, which the Yemenis call Mayun, which is at the entrance of, of the Bab al-Mandab. So, you know, that is really, that is a very definite geostrategic uh, position. Other than that, you know, the rest of the world, and I think, you know, that's something one can debate about. But, you know, for the US, for the Brits and others, you know, their interest in Yemen for the last 15, 20 years has just been counter-terrorism. If right, there wasn't right. AQAP, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't care. Right. If they saw, they, they saw it, you know, as AQAP territory, we've got to do something about that. You know, ignoring the fact that Yemenis have suffered far more from terror than any foreigners, and that basically the factors that are leading people to join these outfits, you know, are, are what should be addressed, not not those outfits themselves. And, you know, again, this is something I often say, which is what surprises me in a place like Yemen and many others. It's not how many people join these outfits. It's how few people join these outfits. 
given the you know given the living conditions that they face and today the absence of you know alternative serious ideologies or political movements that one can support i mean who is offering you and who is offering you a solution to your problems you know we may all think that the solutions offered back up are completely completely crazy but at least they're offering something with some people you know they they are dealing you know you're unemployed you've got no job you've got no respect you've got nothing here's a gun at least you can be you know you can be macho and walk around with your gun yeah um and i think that that could actually be that there's a parallel taking place in a lot of countries uh from what you describe as a kind of lack of alternatives um but you know i wanted to ask you this is more of a, a local question and i know i've taken up a lot of your time so i promise just a few more questions but you know is it is it true that uh growing cot the narcotic that oh. many yemenis chew has depleted the country's water supply and damaged its agriculture i don't know how much expertise you have on like agricultural issues but i was just curious if you had a response to that oh i have a lot to say about that okay you? you should have seen some of my multiple writings on the topic of water water and environment is the main thing i focus on these days no yem i mean Gat does use a lot of water, but Gat only grows at certain altitudes, basically between 700 and 1100 meters above sea level. Uh, it can also be cultivated rain-fed, but it does produce more if it is irrigated. The reason the country has a very major and fundamental water crisis, well, sorry, the reasons, there are three main reasons, basically. One is the very rapid population growth, i.e. you're having, you know, you now have 30 million Yemenis at unification 30 years ago, you had 11 million. 30 million people need a lot more water than 11 million. The second reason has been the introduction of deep wells, irrigation uh, and well, water pumping, which means that water has been extracted at a much higher rate than it is being replenished. And basically, one third of Yemen's water used annually is uh, from fossil aquifers and is therefore uh, not, um, not renewable by definition. Uh, a third element, which is slightly off my list, is that the distribution of the water is not uh, doesn't correspond to the distribution of the population in the sense that the most populated areas, which are again the highlands mostly inhabited by uh, Zaydis, but also the southern highlands, which are inhabited by, by Sunnis, uh, are the most get the most rain, but have the most difficulties geologically of conservation of water therefore they need to they can use the water uh, as it comes and again back to the third problem of course which is climate change and climate change and environmental issues which is play you know which is basically reducing the capacity of water retention particularly on the terraces and is you know making worsening the the is cutting down on the amount of water that is actually available, even if rainfall is higher. So all the GAT is consuming a fair amount of water. It is not the only culprit. Um, basically, deep well irrigation is the main culprit. And I'm no great enthusiast of GAT, to be honest. I'm quite happy to live without it. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you're looking at it from an economic point of view, a small holder with a small holding of GAT of, you know, whatever 100 square meters, can probably live on it for about two or three months. The same amount of sorghum or wheat will last him less than a week, if that. So, you know, in terms of uh, equity and possible possibilities at the, at the household level and, in you know, small holdings of GATT are, you know, a far more reason, a, 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 the most reasonable form of agriculture. There have been attempts to replace GAT by coffee, um, but coffee does not provide the same level of income. And another positive element for GAT for a producer is that you can harvest it three or four or five times a year. So it gives you a regular income as opposed to a single one-off uh, income. 
So you you know it is important, and but on the other hand, also it's not you know it's being turned into a sort of the, the issue in Yemen. It isn't. It's one of many issues, and you know, cancel GAD from the Yemeni economy, and you have an unemployment rate which doubles. Well, I'm not sure that it can double. We I think it's well over fifty percent already. Jeez. <laughs> oh, so I guess my next question for you would be, um, and maybe from what you said earlier, you're not, but. I guess I'll ask you anyway, are you hopeful that this conflict can be maybe resolved isn't the right word, but de-escalated further with the Biden administration, which unlike the Trump administration is willing to at least engage with the Houthis? I think, you know, I certainly think the, the war will end one day. I think they all do, but how soon and how is a different question. I think the the Biden administration really is not that important with respect to what's happening in Yemen. I mean, number one, it suffers in Yemen as it does in plenty of other places by the you know Afghan debacle. I mean, you know the the Afghan debacle means that you know U.S. allies no longer trust it, and U.S. enemies are incredibly pleased and happy. <laughs> Uh, and enthusiastic and see see positive prospects, I think not always justifiably, but still. Um, so I think, you know, Biden did two things which seemed like a good idea at the time, at least as far as he was concerned. The first one was removing the Houthis from the list of foreign terrorist organization, which had been one of Trump's last minute pieces of action to make life difficult for Biden. I don't think Trump gave a damn about the Yemenis or the Houthis. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I, I mean, I certainly think it was a good idea to do that, but I think it, and many others think, you know, it could have, he could have you the Biden administration could have used this tactically by trying to get some concession in, ex in exchange for this rather than just, um, you know, do giving it away, basically. And he appointed, you know, Lender King as his special envoy. And, you know, Lender King has been going around like the previous UN guy, uh, getting nowhere fast, basically. <laughs> I think... Um, I think, I suspect the U.S. administration, I could be entirely wrong, I have no idea what the U.S. administration thinks, no, none, I don't talk to these guys and they don't talk to me, but I assume that they think that talking to Iran and the JC, reviving the JCPOA might help solve the Yemeni situation. I think their constraints with respect to JCPOA are much wider and much more problematic. Um, I think the Iranians, you know, could nudge the Houthis in one direction, but the Houthis aren't going to take orders from the Iranians any more now than they did in the past. Right. And I think one reason the war is continuing, I think I may have said this earlier, you know, the Saudis want to get out. The question is, you know, the Houthis in a sense need the war now more than the Saudis because the Houthis need it to keep the unity within their their the people who are fighting with them. And, you know, it, 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 the justification of an aggression ends the moment the aggression ends, so that, you know, this is something that they, they need. I think the other two elements that, you know, are some reason to be a little bit less pessimistic than usual is the, the new UN special envoy. Uh, unlike the previous ones who were either Brits or incredibly closely related to Britain. And Britain's <laughs> role is, you know, extremely do, do what the GCC wants rather than what the Yemenis might possibly need. The, the new UN special envoy is a Swede, so he's from a neutral country, which has a reasonable reputation. He spent the last two years as EU ambassador, which means he's been well into the whole issue now in great detail, and also prior to that was involved in the region. So he has plenty of experience. He knows what, the, what he's facing. And, you know, I think, again, another counter effect of what's happening with the um, with, with the, the Saudis and everything else, and, and we saw with the U.S. and Afghanistan, is that while it's lowered U.S. Uh, credibility, it sort of simultaneously increased potential European credibility. So, <laughs> you know, it, the, he's, this, this could be an advantage to get him to 
achieve something. But he needs a new UN resolution because the current one is just totally unrealistic and completely unacceptable. And it has two major faults. One is that it you know, legitimizes the internationally recognized government, which has practically zero presence on the ground. And it demands Houthi withdrawal, which is just completely absurd when the Houthis have made such gains. You know, it's just not serious. Right, right. I, I wanted to ask you as well, you know, Helen, why do you think it is that Yemen gets so little attention despite the devastation that this war has wrought across the country, which is at the which is really like an unparalleled humanitarian disaster these last few years. Why so much attention for Syria and for Palestine, which of course deserve attention, but why so much more for these other places? Well, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. <laughs> um, I, I think you know. from from a European point of view, I think one big difference is that, you know, Syria has millions of refugees about who've managed to get to Europe. It's, there's a few more millions sitting in Turkey trying to cross, in, cross into Greece or Italy. Uh, there are no millions of Yemenis who have come. There's a few dozens maybe who've come that far. So the, the threat of, you know, illegal immigration by all these refugees just doesn't exist in Europe. And I think that certainly is a is a is a factor for for Europe, for the U.S. I, I honestly don't know. Other than I think one element, of course, is complete ignorance. I mean, I heard from a friend today that she was asked in the last few weeks, "What is Yemen?" And I told her, you know, I remember that twenty years ago when you talked, you were working on Yemen. People didn't say, "Where is it?" They said, "What is it?" And my position today is I wish people would be asking me what is it, you know, and, and of the war. Because now the only thing people know about Yemen is that it's got a war. They, they don't know that it's a country, you know, with wonderful people, fantastic sceneries, incredible history, you know, architecture. You know, it can go on forever about all the fantastically wonderful things about that country and its people. And I guess that would bring me to one of my final questions, which is what initially piqued your interest in Yemen? I mean, you spent over four decades basically studying Yemen, visiting Yemen, all of it, most, and especially the rural areas. Um, why? Why did Yemen take up so much of your professional well, and I mean, personal it, time? <laughs> it, it, it started politically because I first went to live in the PDRY to help build socialism. You know, so that was that was the original thing. And um, then I moved to the YAR, like most Yemenis did, to earn some money because I needed some. And um, I think Yemen has, you know, a lot of people who got involved in Yemen basically get hooked on the place. And I think it's not it's not its politics that gets us hooked. It is the people, the culture, the sceneries, the music, you know, all kinds of different elements of of the country, which are, you know, extremely different from the Mashrek. I mean, it's extremely different from the Mashrek, extremely different from the Gulf, extremely different from North Africa. And, you know, which are very, very unique. And I think, you know, I mean, most people I know who've been involved with Yemen over a very long period, basically, we just get hooked on the place. Well, Helen Lackner, author of the book Yemen in Crisis, Road to War, and more importantly, I suppose the forthcoming book, Yemen, Poverty and Conflict, which is to come out next year. Uh, where can people follow along? I know that you've been writing for the European uh, Council on Foreign Relations. What's the best way for people to follow your work? I don't do tweets. I don't <laughs> do WhatsApp. I don't do I'm any of those things. I'm jealous of you. I'm I, jealous write, of you for that. <laughs> I, I write quite a lot of stuff. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it, you know, most of what I do really is chapters and long pieces in books. I mean, right now I'm waiting for three items which should have dropped through the letterbox in the last three weeks and haven't. I'm really <laughs> Um And various other things. I mean, I write regularly for a thing called Arab Digest, but that's on subscription only. Mm -hmm. um, I have friends who retweet what I write, but um, I'm afraid uh, people have the told book. me I'm <laughs> well, doing. Your, your, your books are all invaluable resources. I mean, you've also written about Saudi Arabia quite some time ago. Um, you have, so if, I guess people can just go uh, look up all of, all of your incredible work. I really appreciate you taking the last hour to, to break this all down for us. Helen, thank you so much.